thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules in your afternoon to attend today's joint uh, Glural Siler webinar series featuring our guest, uh, guests today from US EPA's Research Triangle Park office, John Imes and Ross Linetta. Uh, John is a geospatial scientist with 17 years of geospatial analysis experience, looking primarily at air-water interfaces at multiple scales. Uh, he focuses on looking at the accuracy and error of remote sensory products and comparing that with in situ derived uh, data. And he's currently uh, the co-lead of a project that's looking at terrestrial remote sensing products within a multi-agency NASA funded research project looking at cyanobacteria counts in freshwater aquatic systems. So that is John. Um, Ross Linetta is a CSER senior research scientist, also at US EPA's Research Triangle Park office, and by the way, both of them are within the National Exposure Research Laboratory. Um, Ross has a broad range of experience, including being a Michigan native um, uh, from, the far, uh, from the Bloomfield Hills area, uh, and also worked in Detroit at the Army Corps office there for several years, um, currently with EPA looking at advanced uh, systems, remote sensing systems, and spatial data analysis tools for better understanding landscape condition, and particularly changes at watershed and regional scales. Um, also looking similar with what John is doing in integrating in situ water quality data with satellite-based products, um, all within the context of remote sensing derived data, uh, spatially distributed landscape processes, and other initiatives. So. Without further ado, uh, please help me welcoming Ross and John today, and we'll turn it over to them. Thank you guys for coming. So John, if you could just um, be sure to speak into the mic. We have several people on the webinar. Will do. Thanks, Drew. So uh, Drew goes back with our days at EPA when uh, he did his postdoc um, there in Research Triangle, and we've kept up the relationship and appreciate the uh, invite to come on out here and speak with you all. Um, as you know, Ross uh, went to Wayne State and Northern Michigan. I don't have the uh, Midwestern roots. I don't really know all the different cities. This morning we spoke um, at the Corps of Engineers in Detroit, and we were, I was trying to tell the group about this lake that was in Ohio, and I said it's somewhere between Cincinnati and Toledo, and they said that's the entire state. And so uh, that's about my knowledge of, of where I am now. I know I'm in Ann Arbor. But uh, today, I, we would like to speak about a project, this project, uh, it's a five-year project that uh, was initiated through NASA uh, looking at uh, cyanobacteria and in freshwater systems. Uh, where We most, mostly focus, I know your group mostly focus on the Great Lakes. We're looking at the, uh, the, the inland waters uh, in particular. And this is driven by the fact that um, we're looking at using satellite data to track in near real time uh, these blooms and um, allow the public to also have access to this information. And that's what this network is all about. And so previously, prior to this big grant, uh, this five-year grant, uh, we had looked, Ross in particular, with some of his colleagues at Cyano uh, looking at uh, the MERIS satellite and doing some um, looking at the correlations there. This project is linked up with four agencies, NOAA being one, and NASA, USGS, and, and us at EPA. And so quick disclaimer, and we'll move through that, quickly read. Oh, and I, for my own disclaimer, uh, our role uh, within this project is, is looking at the linkages, the environmental linkages for these cyano uh, blooms. And uh, Ross brings in particular his expertise in aquatic and marine and uh, the cyano uh, background. I bring in the terrestrial. That's, I'm a forester by background. And so um, at times I may uh, give it over to Ross for a few minutes and he may say a few things if I miss something on some of these slides. But the first thing I want to do is just talk about, you know, the main issues, as you well know, this, this audience is well um, informed about what's happening. but. Uh, you know, looking at the uh, cyanobacteria, chlorophyll A, and turbidity, um, we want to be able to operationally monitor these um, using these techniques. Um, basically, we've been limited by the fact that it's, it's been 
mostly in situ data that's been available to us. And uh, there hasn't been much standardization, not easy to access the data. And, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the overall goal for this project is not just for this to be a research entity, but to get this data and this information down to the end user, down to the management level also. And we'll talk about that. Oops. So what are they saying? Very good. So the, our goals are to basically get a standardization and to uh, develop uh, a cyano index to disseminate, to get this information system out, produced specifically by a, a satellite system. Uh, we want to be able to also, as I explained earlier, explore the connections, the linkages between health, economic, and environmental conditions to these blooms. Uh, at EPA, our role primarily is with human health and the environment, and so we're exploring those linkages. Whereas the other players in this USGS is really dealing with the algorithm development. Um, many of you know Rick, Rick Stumpf, and then um, with NOAA. Um, being able to, actually NOAA develops the algorithms, USGS does the validation, and then um, us working on the health issues and the environmental connections. Uh, and NASA ultimately will disseminate the data once it's out. Um, the benefit for what we're dealing with here is that we're able to access uh, a large number of inland lakes, over 153,000. This is a uh, this is beneficial in the fact that in situ data only can access um, localized data, localized information, and we're able to now uh, get this in a timely manner um, for the entire CONUS area. And so our questions, you know, looking at what are the environmental drivers that control the development of these cyano blooms? Um, and I'll look later at the different variables that we're pulling together to look at the, uh, the up lake uh, watershed level areas and variables that might impact that. Um, which drivers um, give us the best predictive ability for both uh, near and long term bloom potential? And then, you know, what are the best management practices to mitigate uh, these issues? So again, I, I mentioned that uh, there are a number of different groups involved, and this flow chart uh, basically shows the different groups. At EPA, we've got uh, a number of different we've got a number of different labs that are working together uh, to deal with both the the health impacts and the environmental impacts. Um, we are, as an example, looking at the correlation, looking at uh, hospital visits where bloom activity has happened. So we're trying to pull those, that information together. Um, we're looking at uh, environmental factors, the cost. You guys had that uh, two years ago, that Toledo event. And so we're trying to figure out the environmental costs and factors uh, to these bloom events too. And um, so again, I mentioned all the different players. Uh, specifically, USGS uh, has allowed, um, is doing the validation and with the algorithm. Um, they're also providing uh, data for a Landsat 8 surface water temperature product. And so we're in the midst of validating that right now. And, uh, and ultimately, um, we're looking at um, bringing in Sentinel-3 um, into the fold as far as, a value, as far as getting these chlorophyll values. And so, so right now we have uh, Landsat with USGS. So Landsat, we're looking at for Landsat 8, the uh, temperature product and um, with Sentinel-3 in VIRS, uh, NOAA's looking at um, bringing that into the fold as far as the cyano counts and um, what EPA is going to be doing is bringing that into a distribution um, mode and uh, into a mobile app we'll talk about as well as a website that distributes environmental data called the EPA's Enviro Atlas. And so this just gives a, uh, there's a lot of players as you know uh, when you get a lot of players, it's 
can be challenging for um, any type of science product, but uh, to have four agencies, and this just gives a list of the number of people involved. The reason I wanted to bring this up is we've got a number of folks here in the Great Lakes area that we work with uh, that you may be familiar with. Um, we just met with a Corps of Engineers down in Detroit, and um, there was also a Corps of Engineers individual who was in um, uh, Cincinnati that's also involved in this. And continue. Excuse me. There we go. So we mentioned earlier that we've already done some uh, smaller studies to look at the ability of Maris to detect uh, these blooms. And we initially worked in three different areas. And you can see that in one area is New England, another area is in Ohio, and um, lastly we worked in Florida and um, to look at these blooms. So the, uh, the lake is in Ohio is St. Mary's. Um, are you all familiar with St. Mary's? Um, that's, uh, that's what we looked at intensively. And Maris, the satellite Maris, is a, has a temporal um, collect of every two days. So it's very, very uh, fine scale in that manner. We get a lot of data. Uh, however, it's at a 300 meter resolution, so we're limited as far as the size of lakes that we can actually um, we can actually image and get information from. And so really the size of lakes we're looking at is at least a 15 hectare lake. Now obviously the lake has to be the formation of that lake if it's narrow uh, we're not going to be able to get a pixel in there. So we're really looking at a window of about a 3 by 3 Maris uh, window with a single pixel that we can get from the middle. So that's why we're uh, we're limited to 15 hectares and above uh, for these lakes. The next slide shows the results of um, the Maris cell counts versus the in situ. We've got a lot of data in these areas. And you can see that there was a sign of bending or clumping that was going on within this data and uh, some good correlation. So we decided instead of taking the uh, individual values to go ahead and bend them. And the bending produced basically a low, medium, high, and very high um, ranges for, for these different cell counts. And um, what we noticed is that uh, this bending did not correspond, doesn't really correspond well to the uh, World Health Organization um, definition of low, medium, and high and all those things. They're, that's more of a random definition or designation for the different uh, cell counts. And um, the problem is, is that it, there is a, what the satellite detects is more surface area versus what we just talked about earlier with the, uh, with the cell counts being in situ and collected that way. So it was kind of a little bit of, of apples and oranges as far as that goes. We've discussed a few of these slides. Do you have any input you want to make? Doing good? I'm excited I'm getting back to the terrestrial here in a second. So as we pursue this, you can see the correspondence with the in situ data at these different bending levels. We get very good correspondence at the low and the very high, but in the middle, the, the uh, medium and the high values, we, we definitely got more confusion. And again, we think this is in reference to the, uh, the in situ data being more cell count versus the satellite data deriving more of a cell area or a uh, cell volume or cell area. So our purpose, one of our other segments of this project, and we have some folks down in Athens, Georgia, who are developing um, a, a Cyan mobile application. Our intention is to push this data to the public so that they have access, at least on a weekly time step, to view where these blooms are occurring and can be pushed definitely to the mobile app. Um, initially, we developed this 
through um, a particular uh, uh, vehicle and uh, it was initially developed to go to the Apple system. Uh, however, EPA changed um, that everything would be Android, so we lost that, so we had to go to Android. So we've been kind of going back and forth, but right now it's definitely in the Android world. And the way this works is that uh, basically the user will be able to go in and get a graphic, pick out their lake of interest, um, and we'll have these different, different values of low, medium, high, or very high uh, for the counts for that particular date. And we have this in beta form, form right now. And here again is the graphic. And so it'll give you, um, obviously, a geolocation. It'll also give you um, a visual of the lake itself and the distribution, the geographic distribution of the, uh, the outbreaks, the Sino. And then it'll give you a time series, too, of what's happening. And so from a prior study that Ross had mentioned, um, they had looked at data from the St. Mary's Lake in Ohio. And you, you all are well aware enough that... Uh, Things definitely changed here, and um, this is from the Maris satellite um, to be able to detect these uh, Sino outbreaks. And this has been done for for many people relating chlorophyll with uh, you know with the actual in situ data. This has been um, done here, and it's done for the algorithm development for the Maris satellite, and it's being done for Sentinel two. So. I mentioned that the USGS, one of the important variables that obviously that goes into the development of these blooms is, uh, is temperature, lake temperature. And uh, the uh, Landsat 8 is being developed for a surface temperature product by USGS right now. And we're in the midst of, of uh, assessing that product. We've assessed it for currently for the, uh, this data right here uh, is for basically center pixels within the middle of the lake. And um, we're waiting for data to come in and their information so I can go ahead and get the edge of lakes too. So we want to know that transitional area where it's part land, part lake, um, to see if that's also holding. Um, because a lot of these blooms, obviously, as you know, extend over to those edge areas. And we want to make sure that those lake temperatures are also well correlated. And, um, and we're also applying this too to the uh, estuaries. So here are some of the ongoing efforts, and um, so we've got the, the algorithm, and we are a little bit, we're, we're still, we just got the data in for the Maris from 2002 to 2012, and we're beginning to, I'm going to show you some slides on that here in a, here in a minute, and um, the data will be publicly available. You're familiar with CDAS, it's a NOAA site, you guys, correct? Is that right? You guys are all on in on that one. It's all new to me, but CDAS is uh, one of the areas they're going to be uh, storing this data and serving it out. Um, but uh, as mentioned, we've also we've we've already looked at it regionally, and um, the Sentinel data is going to become available fairly soon with the uh, the Ocean Color Land Imager that instrument with on that sensor, and that's also at 300 meters. And this is just an example of a couple of the lakes that we've looked at in California. And, um, you know, looking at the in-situ data, which is on the bottom of the, uh, the slide, and the, the Maris data is up on the top, and looking at the distribution and trying to see how well the algorithm performs. Okay, so for this, this slide, the early results of the, the cyan study is that uh, we're, the, the, the take-home message is, are the blooms, are they getting better or are they getting worse? And it's been a hard question to answer just with uh, data that's, that's uh, sporadic or regional and everything else. You can look, people do many studies on, on a lake level basis, but what's it doing across the entire U.S.? And so 
we're hopefully taking this data and be able to look at it on an area basis and on a timely basis, see are they, are they increasing. However, you can see that some of the lakes, like the one in the, if you look at the graph, I don't know if they can see this online, but this, uh, no, you can't see that, but the top graph on the right, um, fairly flat line, fairly stable system. You would say that lake, that lake system is, is not changing that much. And a couple others show a general upward trend where it is actually changing. And so um, the difficulty with this and looking at an area base is that if you understand satellite data, uh, you get, you get uh, atmospheric in interference. And so if you're looking at one lake at one time period, um, it may be interfered that one pixel at a different time period. Um, you may have some sediment issues that are coming up that are interfering with what you're getting back. And so it's not as easy as you may think that you're going to get the exact same number of pixels at every single date. And so um, uh, we're working through these different uh, challenges to try to make, um, to look at these trends to see if we can make a statement on them. All right. Uh, looking at the area, uh, Ross and I are here for two weeks. We're going up to, um, we're leaving here and going to Wisconsin tonight and starting um, uh, really a robust look at some riparian buffers in both Wisconsin lakes that, are, that, are, that have been identified as uh, culprits in the cyanobacteria world, um, both in uh, the Minneapolis area and in Wisconsin. Um, we've taken the Great Lakes Basin and expanded it. Uh, so that we can include a lot of the uh, western portions where North Dakota, South Dakota are, and also extended it through the middle of Vermont so we can catch Lake Champlain, which is, also has a number of uh, cyanoblooms. So the goal here within the environmental aspect, looking at, you know, can we look at causation or look at linkages, is first of all to uh, identify the lakes with high uh, uh, cyano counts um, between these dates of 2002 to 2013. We're assembling variables, um, all kinds of envir environmental variables, which we'll look at here in a minute, uh, at a grid level and also at a huck level, at these 14-digit uh, hucks. And we're looking at lake shed linkages to, um, to possible smoking guns, so to speak. And so here are some fresh images from the data that we just uh, got probably two weeks ago, and that's Lake Winnebago. That's the lake, one of the lakes we'll be looking at in the next couple of days and looking at the lake shed behind that. But you can see the orange and the red areas um, really indicate uh, higher cyano counts for this 2008 date. And um, uh, you can see the distribution, so obviously it's a lake that's impaired. And then looking at the how it uh, is distributed, the lake is the uh, lake shed are all these 14 digit hucks. So there's a number of them here within the unit. The reason we're living in the 14 digit huck world is it because it uh, it also conforms to the Enviro Atlas, which is the US EPA side of distributing um, this data. And so we are averaging also over the 14 digit huck as well as using the original gridded data. So I don't want to go into this great detail, just to know that nitrogen can be nasty um, and um, as it gets in the system, it's just a good slide to have. And so all of us are, fa are fairly aware of, of you know, the uh, human side of nitrate and where it comes from. So obviously the ag side uh, can be fairly large and looking at the different applications. Uh, feedlots. Um, are a big one, and um, and they're a difficult one to map out. If you go on, you know, EPA back in 2007 was able to work with the USDA to get a county level count of of, uh, of uh, constrained, where they constrained animal feedlots, contained animal feedlots, um, these CAFOs, and so they've got them listed at a county number, county level, and so this is the the tricks of trying to work with this type of data. So how do you take the county and you've got these, you may have six 14-digit uh, hucks that represent that county and how do you distribute um, 
you know, that count throughout those 14 digit hucks. Um, do you equally distribute it or, you know, do you go in with finer tune, which is very difficult. And so there's, there's a lot of learning here to how, how to get the best data in here. And so uh, there's obviously all these other issues that are going on for sewage and lawns and parks and percolation. And so um, the CAFOs are a big deal, row crops obviously, and you can read these bullets on your own. Ag lands are primary source and um, a lot of loading that can go on within these ag systems. Where my world comes in is um, we're looking in this research and actually over the next two weeks is really identifying the riparian buffers and um, they can be very effective in removing nitrogen and what we found is that the most effective buffers are ones that, that are a mixture of uh, forested land and have a grass shrub understory. And, um, and so you don't, want a, you don't want a buffer that's 100% canopy closure because it, it shades out everything underneath. And, and so any storm event, large storm event, that overland flow is not going to be, it's not going to be stopped. But if you have just a grass buffer, that's a good thing. But it also, but what what's going to happen with that is it's just going to mat down over a big storm event, and um, so you need the mixture. What they found, you need the mixture of both, kind of a 50% canopy, 30% canopy, with that undergrowth, because the uh, the trees allow that rooting system for the waters to percolate on down and trap that, as well as the grass. And so. Um, we're going to be evaluating some of the buffers within this region, these lake sheds, um, to see their, their efficiency um, over this time period. And I think I just mentioned this. So they have to have all these different elements. And one thing too that uh, is interesting about the buffer uh, is that, um, you know, in, in North Carolina, there's a best management practice of having a 30 meter buffer on each side of the uh, of a stream. Um, farmers are, are asked to go ahead and join that methodology. They don't have to, um, but others, developers, have to go ahead and, and do that. Um, what we're finding too is that it's not, it may not be necessary to have that 30 meter along that whole extent, but there is a, you know, the, the source nitrogen on an ag field um, based on the flow lines as you go down through a digital elevation map, um, the entry point is where you really need to focus that, where the sink is, where that, that sink cell is. And so we believe that, you know, identifying these and seeing the expanse and how wide they may be at this level may have to have a wider one um, at the expense of maybe narrowing it at some of the other areas. And so these are some of the questions we're looking at and we'll be looking at that over the next two weeks too on these these uh, source sink areas. These are some of the variables that we're looking at. Um, right now, I think we're up to um, up in the upper 70s, and uh, we have variables that are that are uh, using different hydrologic model, models, uh, moving nitrogen across the surface, and we're getting what's called edge of field nitrogen at a pixel level and that'll be implemented into this uh, project too. And so we're doing a number of different things. We're going to model this at the Huck level, but also um, on a factorial basis using um, kind of the pixel level too. So it's kind of a dual thing to see what type of results uh, we might be able to get. Yeah, yes. Right. Wetlands will be included in that. Yes, sir. Yep. That's a good point. And I, I include that as a buffer, right, period. That's kind of my definition, too. It goes beyond that. It's a, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. So the question was, are, are wetlands also included within riparian buffers? And that's how we look at them, too. So. And this... Uh, I shouldn't have put this slide up. And this is just a graphic of, of uh, looking at the data now and looking at some of the higher levels of 
Um, like right here is the percent woody wetland within a 100 meter buffer. And, uh, you know, obviously that's a, a, a variable that is beneficial up to an extent, as we just talked about as far as the, uh, the crown coverage. And um, these are the hucks within this Great Lake Basin, just a section of it. And these are riparian slopes that are fairly steep. And um, you're going to get more extreme nitrogen possibly put into the system based on the slope. And then around your area here shows uh, riparian canopy cover that's, that's really low. Uh, so you're getting kind of the grass area or, or even 0%. And so you can see that uh, um, Michigan has a lot of a lot of riparian buffer that's uh, probably not meeting that perfect, uh, you know, if you want to say perfect um, characteristic of what would be helpful. So there's a lot of it there. So we're going to be getting into this and teasing this out. Again, we're in the the first really six months of this project, and we're just now getting the data. So you're you're getting the initial stages of this. I think that's it. Okay, soil erosion, so um, greater than 30 percent. And uh, that's all I have. Ross, do you have any any last thing you'd like to say? Right. So I'm going to do something which is probably dumb, is try to go on the web and find this. Can I do this here? It's not minimizing. Why don't you pass that? Yeah. You, you mentioned a lot about nitrogen, but uh, is phosphorus is a real issue too? But is nitrogen your surrogate at this point? No. Uh, phosphorus is in play. Uh, we're, we're also tracking phosphorus. But great question. Yeah, I, I'm a. The better way to think of that would be nutrient potential. So that'd be a better term to use. Any other questions while we get this? Is this frozen? Oh, there we go. He's hiding over well, there. How do I get so, that? in order for the webinar to see yeah. it, it needs to be on that screen. So, so you'll have to um, like play with it. Do here. like that, unfortunately. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Viro. Uh, okay, so this this is a this is a very good website uh, for um, accumulating all these different environmental variables uh, across the entire 48 states, and um, they have um, done a number of different <coughs> data analysis that you can find here, and so uh, I. I one of the, this is one of the areas that our 14-digit HUC um, scale up will, will ultimately reside, as well as the mobile app. So I wanted to bring this up, and I'm going to go ahead and fire this up as we talk, and uh, see if I can actually find the map. It's somewhere in here. It's probably down here. Oh, here Just to say something while John's doing that, what what this will do is not only be a repository for the data. But uh, the landscape of colleges have developed numerous analytical tools that will be associated with this site. So you can go in and not only grab the data, but also do analyses. And this is going to migrate up to the uh, Amazon cloud. So you'll be able to go in, access this, get data. Uh, you won't have to download it if you don't want. If the tool's there you need, you can do the analysis right up in the cloud and then download your products. Yeah, so anyways, as this loads up, um, any other any other questions? Yeah, yeah, one other, one other complicating factor I need to should consider is the fact that the nitrogen cycle is closely interrelated with the tress metal cycles. Mm -hmm. You can have all the nitrogen in the world. If you don't have any of the essential tress elements, you're not going to get any blooms, right? And so I think when you are looking at what are some of these factors you use for correlating or predicting the blooms, 
I think you may also need to look at trace the distribution metal. of the, some of the very essential trace metals. Very good. No, that's in a fact, good point. What I suspect personally is that in areas where you don't have adequate trace metals, you tend to have phenotypes that may be more toxic. Again, this is really a hypothesis that I'm trying to work on. Uh, we are trying to do something. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my name is Jerome Riaga. I'm in the School of Public Health, University of Michigan. Very good, thank you. I just want to say, yeah, we, um, first of all, thank you for the talk as a continuum, but let's take a moment to thank John for your talk. You're welcome. <laughs> We have plenty of time for questions, so we have we can pass around the microphone for questions in the room. It's a great way to, to get them articulated, and there may be questions online as well. But the, the floor is open for questions or comments. <laughs> sure, I, I have one more, and then I'm going to be quiet for a while. For a while. <laughs> um, the you, you're using at this point uh, Rick Stump's standard CI index his standard algorithm mm -hmm. okay um, and for those in the audience that that don't know the history and it's great work but the satellite the ocean color satellites gave us the bands they're not necessarily optimum bands to detect blue green algals what we've done is with Maris a lot of good European work that Rick mm -hmm. uh, made better, essentially. We've taken those bands, same with our modus, same with Veers, which is mm -hmm. almost identical to, to modus. Uh, modus, and we've created these indices and then related those to the in-situ measurement. They are really again a surrogate. They're not true. They're not truly blue green. They're not truly harmful algal blooms. Now, what what we've learned in the Great Lakes, Gary Fonestiel, that used to work here and is retired now, he's learned that these high chlorophylls, and that's really what the CI stump index is, that that if you look at that, and then if the temperature is 18 degrees C or higher, then there is a high probability, at least in Ohio, western basin of Lake Erie, that these are going to be halves. But mm. there is a inference here. This is not the CI is, is truly detecting these halves. It's inferring. And again, if we have the temperature, that's why I commend you that you're working the temperature piece. Mm -hmm. I think as you get more mature, and and if we do have water temperature, again, it's surface temperature, and there are issues with skin depth, as you mm -hmm. pointed out, John, that the satellite is only looking at right. the upper surface of the lake, and we have to infer the volume part of it. Right. But, but if we ignore all that, having temperature as a secondary value is going to make your predictions even better. Perhaps. And, mm -hmm. Well, they will be better. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and, and then at some point you can think about false alarms, because I did see on your one plot you had blooms and it didn't look like a track. It looked like you had a couple of false alarms mm -hmm. and I forgot, Wisconsin data center, one of them at that point. And, and I encourage you guys at some point to think That's about what, what we do a lot of work for the military. It's it's all about false alarms. They mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't want us crying wolf. And, right. and I think you have to be careful as you move forward, popping up too many maps and scaring grandma and the kids. That's a good point. Thank you. Yeah, one of the things also that's part of this project is going to be a continuing validation effort. So there's going to be a number of validation site set up across the United States, which will be based on existing long-term in-situ sampling sites that are committed to continuing that activity going forward. So validation will be an ongoing thing with this project. So 
you can't have enough of it, obviously. Okay. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, so sure. There, are, uh, there is a little bit of time for questions, but it sounds like maybe we have a question or two from the webinar. Are we considering uh, low nutrient bodies? Is that what you said? We're yeah, we're considering everything. We we're we've got uh, we're going to be doing um, lakes that are impaired that have a, a history of impairment, plus every lake that fits the criteria of 15 hectares or, or greater. So that's going to be low nutrient bodies, everything. Everything's going to be covered. Hopefully I answered that okay. That's what it's looking for. Let's take, let's take time for one more question before we break. And we folks can save it for a question, so we'll do one more formal question, right? Sure. Among inland lakes, is the relationship between your satellite signal and either chlorophyll A or cell count or whatever you're using consistent, or does it differ among lake types or depending on the landscape setting or have you looked at that kind of thing? We're, we're, we're just getting the data in now and so those things will be taken into account. That's a, that's a great question. I think uh, um, we're going we're gonna to be looking for a localized issues and, and, and all those different things and right now before we came I was you know just running just the basic stats on, on this Great Lakes area you know the histograms for that to see the distribution and where they were. So we're really at this nascent stage of everything, but that's exactly where we're going to be going. Yeah. So catch us in three years, we'll come back in or two years. We should say one year. <laughs> yeah, just you know this CI index that we're getting from NASA. They're the ones that are processing it using Rick's algorithm. So we just got the data for it our initial study area. So we're not to even a version one product yet for those people that are f uh, familiar with things like MODIS where you have different versions and I expect we'll have the same thing here but we haven't declared V1 yet. And uh, the other thing is you know they are anticipating to get uh, ocean land color imager imaging data coming in probably now about this time some initial data sets to start working on that because that's going to be the workhorse going forward is the uh, ocean land color imager. So NASA will be uh, starting up with that as well. So and we'll start ingesting that data. So anyways, this is the uh, Enviro Atlas. You can play around with it. Um, but this is where the data will be housed at some point. And um, we'll be getting the, the HUC data up there as we're producing this. And um, as we mentioned, also the MERIS data will be available to you to work with on the CDAS site. And, and one last comment. So for scientific folks, this is probably the preferred site to go. The mobile app is more for, do I want to take my kid to the beach, this beach or that beach today? And, and you know, some of the other things we're working on NASA with is to, is to get faster turnaround in the future. Instead of the typical 24-hour turnaround from acquisition, can we get it in a couple hours? So maybe you can get same-day data, take a look at your lake make decisions. And and this is the this is the tool where we developed that lake shed, that image I showed you earlier that showed uh, Winnebago and all the different hucks that contributed to that lake. Um, you, you can access it this directly um, not right this second, it's in beta version, but it will be it'll be up. So you'll be able to get those as far as what's contributing to these these freshwater systems on a lake shed level. Okay? Sure. Northern. Okay. Yeah, I knew someone would catch that. That was a bad. That was probably the the, the slide as far as uh, putting up the cell number, the cell count. Um, I probably could have. 
termed it better, but what we're looking at is um, a value of 10,000 or more um, to be our indicator that something's happening in the lake. So that, that basically allows us to see um, that, uh, that, that, that there is impairment, whether it's a low, medium, or high. And so, um, but good question. Um, is that it? Okay, thank you.